welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 197. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mike. I mean, this is a great, exciting, dare I say, happy day for us as we're digging into another fantastic show on in the Happiness Series. However, Mike, we are coming to the end of this series today, aren't we? Oh, no. Um, Well, the only way our expert today would have us process that information Mm. is in a happy way. That's right. Let let us turn ourselves for one last time to this idea of happiness and what are we going to do today? Today, listeners and Moonshots members, we are digging into Sean Acker's The Happiness Advantage. Sean Acker is perhaps doesn't need too much of an introduction, actually, Mike. He has one of the most popular talks ever on Ted's channels. He was a teaching assistant to another Moonshot member, uh, Tal Ben-Shahar. He did a popular happiness course where Sean was one of the teaching assistants, as well as a huge learning class with Oprah Winfrey. So Sean is, is pretty well embedded in what I would call the happiness space. And I think he's a perfect bookend for the end of our happiness series because he touches on some of the frameworks ideas, approaches that maybe we've heard from some of the other individuals within the series, but he also brings to light a handful of really interesting new ideas, frameworks, and even mindsets that I think you and I and the listeners can really learn from. Yeah. So I think coming up for us on this show, we have got perhaps one of the best articulations of uh, perhaps the theme of the series. And so, you know, Sean Aker, he's going to bring it home and really kind of wrap up this aha that we've been having throughout the series. But importantly, he's not just stopping there. He's going to go into some really cool techniques, some habits, the Tetris effect, the fulcrum and the lever falling up. So if this all sounds interesting to you, if you want to bring it home on happiness at the end of this series, then stay tuned to the happiness advantage with Sean Aker. It's all there for us to enjoy. So Mark, this has been a big series. We're about to close it in a very big way. Why don't you guide us, Mark? Where do we begin? Well, we need to hear from the author himself, Sean, who's done all this incredible amount of research at Harvard, studies with test subjects around the world. We need to hear from Sean himself and how he believes and he wants all of us to start doing is starting with happiness and following success second. Here's how we get to health. We need to reverse the formula for happiness and success. In the past three years, I've traveled to 45 different countries, working with schools and companies in the midst of an economic downturn. And what I found is that most companies and schools follow a formula for success, which is this. If I work harder, I'll be more successful. And if I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. That undergirds most of our parenting styles, our managing styles, the way that we motivate our behavior. And the problem is it's scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. First, every time your brain has a success, you just change the goalpost of what success looked like. You got good grades, now you have to get better grades. You got into a good school, now you have to get a better school. You got a good job, now you have to get a better job. You hit your sales target, we're going to change your sales target. And if happiness is on the opposite side of success, your brain never gets there. What we've done is we've pushed happiness over the cognitive horizon as a society. And that's because we think we have to be successful, successful, then we'll be happier. But the real problem is our brains work in the opposite order. If you can raise somebody's level of positivity in the present, then their brain experiences what we now call a happiness advantage, which is your brain at positive performs significantly better than it does at negative neutral stress. Your intelligence rises, your creativity rises, your energy levels rise. In fact, what we found is that every single business outcome improves. Your brain at positive is 31% more productive than your brain at negative neutral or stressed. You're 37% better at sales. Doctors are 19% faster, more accurate at coming up with the correct diagnosis when positive instead of negative neutral or stressed, which means we can reverse the formula. If we can find a way of becoming positive in the present, then our brains work even more successfully as we're able to work harder, faster, and more intelligently. What we need to be able to do is to reverse this formula so we can start to see what our brains are actually capable of. Because dopamine, which floods into your system when you're positive, has two functions. Not only does it make you happier, it turns on all the learning centers in your brain, allowing you to adapt to the world in a different way. We found that there are ways you can train your brain to be able to come more positive. In just a two minute span of time, done for 21 days in a row, we can actually rewire your brain, allowing your brain to actually work 
more optimistically and more successfully. We've done these things in research now in every single company that I've worked with, getting them to write down three new things that they're grateful for for 21 days in a row, three new things each day. And at the end of that, their brain starts to retain a pattern of scanning the world, not for the negative, but for the positive first. Journaling about one positive experience you've had over the past 24 hours allows your brain to relive it. Exercise teaches your brain that your behavior matters. We find that meditation allows your brain to get over the cultural ADHD that we've been creating by trying to do multiple tasks at once, it allows our brains to focus on the task at hand. And finally, random acts of kindness or conscious acts of kindness. We get people, when they open up their inbox, to write one positive email, praising or thanking somebody in their social support network. And by doing these activities, and by training your brain, just like we train our bodies, what we found is we could reverse the formula for happiness and success, and in doing so, not only create ripples of positivity, but create a real revolution. Mark, I listened to this clip and I'm like, I've got it all wrong in life. <laughs> uh oh. Yep. Oh, so so what Sean Aker does in his book, The Happiness Advantages Advantage, is he basically frames how so many of us, and I will admit how I have often thought, which is if I work harder, I'll be more successful. If I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. And he's saying Ladies and gentlemen, you need to invert. You need to reverse all this way of thinking and bring the happiness to the front and the success and everything else will follow later. Mark, do you think you could admit you've fallen for this big trap that Sean Aker points out? Well, I mean, look, I'll I'll, I'll listen and whisper between friends, you know, it's not like you and I, it's not like you and I have a handful of listeners as well. Uh, I am very guilty of it. Um, I I have been for probably, I I would say most of my childhood and adult life, in Mm. fact, Mm. (laughs) but I would say the direction that Sean's taking us here is specifically around success. You know, you don't want to be chasing that promotion, that pay rise or that new job in a new, um, situation or a new business. But for me, actually, Mike, I, I go one step further when it comes to the idea of happiness. And actually I've been guilty in the past of looking to maybe purchase something like a car or maybe it's a new phone or whatever it is, something that I think will make me happy. But the truth is exactly as Sean's breaking down in that first clip, once you get it, are you happy? Maybe a tiny bit, but then you're always going to be looking for the next thing. So this constant mm chase, this constant road that we're trying to almost sprint down in order to uh, get success or be seen as successful. You know, we're really starting to see the ego, I think, come through with regards to the idea of happiness here. Instead, you flip it around and starting with happiness. I mean, Mike, I, I don't know whether I've really thought about doing that before. Have you? Um, well, you know, I, it's it's hard for me uh, to answer the question in that way, because I look at what he's proposing as things that we can do. And we're going to break all of these down uh, throughout the show. Many of the things he talks about journaling, um, writing, exercising, meditating, those are things that are in my daily practice. Mm. But here is where I had a big gap. Is it is my choice right now? I can smile. That's a choice, and that was something where you know he was talking about happiness first, success second. Mm. I think I was doing some of the practices to bring happiness, but I wasn't deliberately choosing for the happiness. I was deferring it, much like he talked about in that clip. And what the, the, the most powerful thing, not only in Sean Aker's work, but in many of the people we've studied, they're saying, choose for happiness now. Mm. And it can be happiness that the coffee you're drinking tastes great mm. or that it's ridiculously sunny and it's the middle of winter or that I have the chance to sit with a friend and talk about happiness for an hour. How good is that? No deferrals needed right there. Mm. 
and this is where we touch upon mindful pra- mindfulness practices, which I think are essential in unlocking happiness as a, as a practice in the here and now. So I think that's the the help that I needed. Like I can smile. And it's so funny when you just like, you can walk down the street and you can be frowning, you can be blank, or you can smile. And the crazy thing is if you choose to smile, And if you just choose to appreciate something around you, how powerful that can be in realizing happiness Mm. just right now. And it doesn't have to be such a big thing way off in the horizon, does it? Well, yeah. And I think you you touched upon it really well there. It isn't this huge aha moment, a singularity that one day you might reach, Mm. you know, say when you retire, you know, I'll be happy when I retire. So it's always this big moment or event, Hmm. monumental, life-changing. But instead, exactly as you've said, Mike, it's as simple as sitting here, smiling while we record. It's as simple as walking to the coffee shop, maybe smiling at a neighbor. And all those small little things that seem inconsequential and pretty small, not big enough to maybe write a book about, but compoundly when they're all put together, I mean, I feel pretty good when I go out and see uh, somebody out in the street and they're smiling. If I see somebody else is happy, I feel that little bit more happy. If I'm positive or pleasant to other people, generally they're pleasant back. And this formula suddenly in for me switches. And then I start thinking, okay, well, actually it is achievable to have that small injection of happiness here and there. It isn't just one big thing that we're all running towards, towards our, I know it's something we can inject right here, right now. And much like anything else, like working out at the gym, happiness is something you can work on and you can do every day and you will feel better every day. And it can just be small things, smiling, being grateful, these sort of habits and behaviors that we're going to talk about a lot Mm -hmm. on this show. But the thing is, if you do it regularly throughout the day, on regular days throughout the week, throughout weeks in months, months in years, It's when you get to the other side of that, that you go, wow, I just feel really good. I Mm. feel happy. I feel a sense of abundance, you know, around Mm. me. But the, the thing is we kind of, it looks like one of those city horizons way off in the future. And what, the invitation on this show today is going to be is to bring the happiness advantage into your daily, your hour practice, bring it into the moment is what is so powerful and why we chose to put Sean Aker as sort of the closing thoughts on a world of happiness to bring a smile to your face. And Mark, I tell you, there's a whole bunch of people who've got a smile on their face too, isn't there? They're so right. These individuals have not only put a smile on their own faces, but certainly a smile on all of the Moonshots family on this side of the microphone as well. So without further ado, in fact, I better do two trumpets because I missed it last time. We are welcoming... (laughs) <laughs> we are welcoming Bob, Niles, John, Terry, Niall, Marjolin, Ken, and Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, and Yasmin, Lisa, and Sid, Maria, and Paul, Berg, Kalman, David, and Joe, Crystal, Ivo, Christian, and Hurricane Brain, Samuela, Kelly, Barbara, and Bob, Andre, Matthew, Eric, and Abby, Jose, and Joshua, Chris, and Kobe, Damien, and Deborah, Gavin, and Lasse, Steve, Craig, Lauren, Javier, Daniel, Andrew, Ravi, and Avert, as well as our brand new members, LGV and Susan. Welcome to the happiness around the Moonshots <laughs> show. Thank you for joining us. I wonder what the LGV stands for. What do you think? Loving good vibes? What oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Loving good go. vibes. Loving yeah. good vibes. Yeah. That's in keeping with the series, <laughs> I, I think. Um, yeah, super, uh, super delighted to see that we've crossed the big 50 mark. Um, in our uh, Patreon members. We're very grateful for the support that you give to us. And it's just a little token from you towards us saying, hey, I'm digging the Moonshots vibes, the happiness vibes. So thank you so much. Um, 
super grateful and we hope that you're enjoying your uh, VIP exclusive Moonshots Master Series that you can get if you are a member on Patreon. And if you're interested in becoming a member, if you're sitting there saying, I'm feeling the vibe, uh, head over to moonshots.io, click on the members button and all shall become yours. We've got a very deep uh, back catalog of goodies and content and you can ask us questions and we answer. We're actually good on the old emails. Mm -hmm. So that's all part of being a member of the Moonshots podcast. So super grateful uh, to you. Now, Mark, with all that gratitude uh, swelling inside of us, with all of this happiness that we've been indulging in for, for many, many weeks, I think it's now time for us to turn towards how we should approach happiness. How do we unlock the happiness advantage, Mark, in this great book by Sean Aker? Well, I think what's fascinating and, and brilliant about Sean's book is he delves into quite practical, let's call them uh, formulas, uh, equations, but also behaviors around your physical behavior, as well as your behavior around mindset. So first of all, let's hear from Sean, again, talking around how your appearance and your approach towards happiness and the way that you process the world all begins with something called the fulcrum and the lever. So what we've been looking for are what are some very practical things that people could do to change the way that they view the world. And what we found is your brain has only a limited amount of resources to think about your world, your life, your family, what's going on that you see happening in the media. And what happens is that if our brain goes first for the negatives, your brain has literally no resources left over to scan the world for the things we're grateful for or the meaning in our life. So what we started realizing is as people were constructing this picture of reality, that there were actually multiple realities that you could construct in every moment. And then we could help people actually start to pick the most valuable reality at the time, the reality that helped move them forward and help them to either be happier or more successful or both. So for example, one of the things we have people do is a very simple activity called the advantage points technique. And what we have people do is think about something that they normally think about as frustrating or negative, like they're overflowing uh, inbox with their emails or, or dirty dishes in the sink. When I talk to people about dirty dishes in the sink, they think that's the opposite of happiness. <laughs> but what we found is even within those moments, we're finding that most people, when they describe it, they'll describe things like, it, you know, it's a chore, it's dirty, it's constant, I can never keep up with it. Both of the, all of those different types of descriptors are negative and it causes us to feel like we don't want to do that work and we don't do it. We are slower towards doing it. And afterwards, we feel frustrated that we had to go through the process. What we have people do is do something different. You can think of all those negative descriptors, but in one minute, we have somebody think of every descriptor they could possibly think for that activity. They get one point for all the negative ones and three points for any positive ones. Mm. So about halfway through that minute with dirty dishes, for example, people start thinking things like it's an opportunity to feel productive or it's an opportunity to show love to my spouse. And what happens is if we have those multiple visions, if we could view something like doing dirty dishes in the sink, if we could do dishes in the sink as an opportunity to show love, what happens is not only do we feel happier through the process, your brain actually has more energy for doing it. You're motivated towards it. And when you finish, you actually feel rejuvenated instead of tired. So simply changing the way that we think about things to choose the positive path actually helps even the most negative tasks become something that can create happiness. Well, Mark, this is a fantastic shift. This is what we love on the Moonshots podcast is when you actually, you, you, you listen to the idea and the happiness advantage and you're like, yeah, that sounds great, but how do I do it? Mm. And this idea of the fulcrum and the lever is where it really sort of transitions between how you think about it and things that you can go and do. Mark, when we go about using this, approach the fulcrum and the lever, where do we start? How do you start doing this in your day? Well, for me, I start to really consider, and this is how I, I interpret it. I really sit back and I consider what are the things that I am uh, seeing around myself that are perhaps impacting my uh, mindset. So some of those things might be positive, some of them might be negative. But what I try and do is maybe objectively look at them. Maybe it's stresses with work. Maybe it's uh, an item on the to-do list, like prepare a moonshot show. Maybe it's something I've got to do around the house. 
And then I'll start to objectively think about each of those items and think, okay, well, how do they make me feel? Are they stressful moments? Maybe the work thing is stressful. Okay, well, let's dig into that. Maybe there's an element of excitement that I can instead pivot around and I can start weighing up the items that are causing me that little bit of maybe anxiety or feeling a bit uneasy and instead try and shift them into something that's a little bit more, I would say, proactive, maybe a little bit more positive. And then what you start to do, and and as I've tried to practice these a little little bit this week, is you start to move away from the items that are really causing you that stress, that anxiety, you know, what we might say keeps you up at night. And instead you're starting to see there's much uh, more weight, I suppose you could say, in the positive stuff, the things that are around you that you've got to do. Maybe it's fixing a house. Well, this is great. My tap will start working again. Or the moonshot show. I love doing moonshots. This is great. Mm. And suddenly those things that maybe upon initial review were things that you kind of wanted to put off until later, but actually when you start <laughs> to do it and you start to think about them from a, 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 a happiness or positive perspective, it suddenly feels that little bit more exciting to try and do. What, how do you interpret them, Mike? Yeah. So, um, definitely there is this, um, little thing that I do. Whereas if I feel, find myself judging or being negative, I try to kind of, the best way I can describe it is to build like an allergic reaction. Mm. Like, uh, no, no, no. Like, um, I try and become very, uh, aware of if I just allow that little voice uh, in the back of my head, allowing any sort of judgment or negativity. So a great example is if someone does something, then, you know, don't be in a rush to assume malice. Like mm. if someone does something that has a negative effect on you, well, you know, step back and say, well, maybe there were things happening that I'm not aware of, right? Mm. Um, and you'll be amazed at how, on how many times we choose to perceive something as, um, a deliberate, uh, negative thing that someone has done towards us. But in actual fact, it was just an honest mistake. And the difference on the energy that I spend on something that's just an, on a, on a, an honest mistake versus some, you know, form of hard, hardship, inconvenience, whatever. Like if, if you just go, oh, it was probably just this benefit of the doubt. The thing is you save yourself all of that energy of like, God damn, what the F, you know, like all of that energy that would happen if, if you were taking things so personally, and this is a choice. Mm. And that to me is where you can rise above like, um, Michelle Obama in her show talked about when they go low, we go high. That's a choice. And that costs you a lot less than spinning your wheels in negativity, judgment, you know, just really, um, unhealthy thinking patterns. Mm. And if you continue to, um, say, uh, I'm going to take a different, I'm going to avoid these negative thinking patterns and you're going to take a bias towards happiness, a bias towards positivity. That is a choice and you create positivity momentum for yourself. You spend your energy going forward rather than being dragged back into the past, digging up old slights, problems, debts, you know, whatever it is, that that's a choice. And I think that what happens over time, if you continually stop yourself from judging or thinking negatively and choose to create a reality of happiness, then in fact, that spreads. So let's say you, you, you focus on that in the morning, then, you know, inevitably the afternoon's going to be pretty good too. But also likewise, Mike, if I'm in a, in a well of self pity in the morning, it's pretty hard to transition into like a fabulous, happy afternoon, isn't it? Well, I mean, look, we, we've heard from individuals like William H. McRaven telling us to make our bed in the morning. And I think the, 
insight around that behavior is actually pretty similar to what we're discussing here. It really depends on how much control you take around the way that you A, behave, and then B, visualize or C, that world around you. Because those are the things that you can control. You can't control whether your drill sergeant is going to bury you up to your neck in sand (laughs) Mm -hmm. as part of an exercise. You can't control if somebody's going to cut you off in their car. You can't control if you are going to receive maybe a, maybe a bad email or a message. And like you say, it's because everybody else has their own things going on as well. But the reality that we carve out of those situations is then something that we can control. We can't control how other people are reacting to things, but we can control how we react to things. And what I think to build on what you are saying is this reality is just your kind of understanding of the world. And if you can change that, if you can recognize the way that you are behaving, the way that you interpret things through reflection, and we'll come onto some of these in a minute, then you can start to change that perspective. And I think that's the big aha for me during this series, this idea of perspective, how you view happiness, how you can try and start to take that little bit more, let's say, ownership or engagement around happiness in order to go out and feel that little bit better. Well, let's let's take one uh, another show. I think that is the absolute epitome of this, which is Yoko Willing Extreme Ownership. Yeah, and something that we always have a lot of fun with is in our Navy SEAL voices <laughs> when Yoko says uh, the world's against you, things are, uh, yeah. are not going your way. The way you respond is problems. Good. Good. Right. (laughs) And, and that really is it. You can say problems. Oh, this is really bad. Oh man, man, stuff is falling apart. Or you can say, you know what? Okay. There is something inside of this that is going to teach me, help me grow, help me learn. And I'm not saying for a moment that it's easy, but what I'm saying it is, it is a choice. Um, You can go about stretching yourself embracing life because things are always going to go wrong in life. And you can go and say, when these things happen, you can say, okay, good. There is for some reason, this is happening for me. And I'm, I'm going to choose to see this as an opportunity for growth. And mm. I'm going to do everything I can to make this a positive. And if you get on the really, if you get through that, you can then get into the Goggin sphere. And that is where you actually search out hardship, mm. challenge. You search for your boundaries and you go beyond. This is the highest level of performance where you not only when things don't quite go as planned, you're like, okay, we'll get through this. There's something in this. It'll be okay. Problems, good. But then you can go, hey, I am going to search out challenge. I'm going to get so comfortable with discomfort, a la Joe Rogan, that you're going to go search out big challenges and you're Mm. going to enjoy being on that edge because you know that's where all your personal growth and potential is. So this is where Sean Aker's thinking goes far beyond happiness, but we can go right up into self-actualization right at the top of Maslow's period. And that I think is super exciting. That is really at the, at the, at the, the destination here is, is far beyond overcoming challenge and having a happy disposition, but you can really be well and truly Mark, the very best uh, version of yourself. And I think that's very exciting, but that ain't all we can learn from Sean Aker, is it? No, absolutely not. Um, I think building on where you were just breaking down in terms of uh, seeing the world around you, almost visualizing how you see those challenges and those problems. Good. Let's hear again um, around the book of Happiness Advantage, this time told from one of our favorite YouTubers, Productivity Game, who breaks down Sean's idea of the Tetris effect. At a study at Harvard Medical School, researchers paid 27 people to play Tetris for multiple hours a day, three days in a row. 
For days after the study, some participants literally couldn't stop dreaming about shapes falling from the sky. They couldn't stop seeing their world as being made up of a sequence of Tetris blocks. One participant said that he would go outside for some fresh air after work, rub his eyes, and look up at the Philadelphia skyline and wonder, if I flip the Victory Building on its side, would it fit into the gap between the Liberties 1 and 2? What this study shows is that when we have repeated exposure to something, it spills into our daily experience, changing the way that we view situations in our daily lives. We have the opportunity each day to activate a Tetris effect of opportunity. This could mean constantly surrounding yourself with stories of perseverance and success. For me, this involves listening to books in my vehicle about successful historical figures like Ben Franklin and Winston Churchill, or listening to a podcast on personal development while working around the house. Each moment, we have an opportunity to condition ourselves with positive resources that increase our ability to naturally see more opportunity around us. Oh, ah, uh, Mark, this one, I mean, for me, this is priming your subconscious. This is something that we learned uh, from Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. But I cannot begin to tell you the power of manifesting, imagining, visualizing, embracing a, a practice of happiness, of resilience, of strength, of determination. It's not only something you can use for happiness, this Tetris effect, but I believe if you want to be a well-rounded, thriving individual, then you can daily repeat and manifest how you choose to be in the world. And I think happiness is a key part of it. Don't you? I think this approach, this Tetris effect idea is a huge um, element, mechanic, framework, practice that we can take away from Sean Aker's book. I think the, and I, I've been guilty of this, Mike, before, and I'm sure you have, and I'm sure lots of listeners, when you're really stressed about something, when, maybe when you're feeling in the dumps hmm. or you've got, you know, this thing hanging over your head, I tend to dream about it. I'll think about it and maybe I'll obsess over it and I'll dream about it. And I love this experiment they did at Harvard. Very simple, play Tetris. Suddenly it spills into your real life. If I'm immersing myself, as we've been discussing on the show, in uh, stressful, uh, dark thoughts, you know, oh, life's so unfair. Oh, I wish I didn't have to deal with this. I'll put it off until tomorrow. And you make excuses and you, uh, the world is against you. What naturally happens? Well, it's like coffee. You know, it's kind of percolating away, isn't it? It's <laughs> staying there. It's got nowhere to go. Whereas, and it's just getting stronger and stronger. For me, this is such a vivid and useful visualization that proves the value of daily mantras, writing down into your to-do list, which is what I do, things that inspire me about working hard. Maybe it's being positive. Maybe it's being efficient. And occasionally looking back at them, I think journaling or reading plays a huge part as well. Just surrounding yourself in these pretty positive practices that start to, as Sean calls out, train the mind into recognizing, panning recognition, into noticing those things that kind of make you feel maybe it's happy, maybe it's positive, maybe it just puts a smile in your face. Mm. And then it starts to have that positive effect on everything else. You start to notice it more, much like we were learning with Dalai Lama. It's this, it's this topic or this habit that once you start doing it, it gets stronger and stronger. You get better at doing it. Like you've already, already said, Mike, it's a muscle that mm. needs to be trained. And this idea of conditioning your mind to view the world in patterns in order to train it to see what I want it to see, the positive blue sky, the smile on my partner's face, maybe it's my dog, whatever it is, these small things that at the time seem pretty small, once you start to build them up into a very positive, almost Tetris effect, again, mm -hmm. building on that visualization for a second, it makes the whole. And I think that's such a fun pattern and behavior that we can do not only for our mindsets, but also things that we can put into practice each day. What, what do you, what come, are you feeling the Tetris effect like I am? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm very big on listening to and repeating mantras 
every single day. And it was a technique that I developed from reading uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. He talks about you have to prime your subconscious um, to want, live, breathe your success, realizing your potential. And a great example was in the months before I ran my first marathon this year, I visualized, committed to, repeated a promise to myself that I would run that race. And I did it. I didn't stop. Thank goodness, because I was a bit knackered, Mark. But (laughs) the point is this. I was of no doubt that I would run that race because for months and months, I was repeating, I will run 42 kilometers. And I said it every day. So like this is the Tetris effect. It just infuses, it It goes from conscious to subconscious. And that's the compound effect. If you really work on things, you can um, every single day, this is why we love Atomic Habits because it's all about not just building habits, it's about building a lifestyle. And what I would propose to you, Mark, this Tetris effect is part of it. The other part of it, I think might be listening to the Moonshots Master Series. What do you think? Yes, I think you're right. I think one of the things that puts a smile on my face is being able to open up my Spotify or any podcast app and actually go out and and seek out the Moonshots Master Series, particularly when I'm fancying a bit of a deeper dive into topics like mind, uh, into first principles, managing people, motivation, uh, all sorts of interesting deep dives into habits like we love to talk about, as well as communication, Mike. Yes. So here's the thing. Maybe Patreon's not your thing, but for more than 40,000 of you, Spotify is. So if you actually go into your Spotify app, you can actually get access to the Moonshots Master Series. You can subscribe to that so you can get it all in the same place. Now, You can go and do it in Patreon, but Mark, why don't you walk us through? How do we find this Moonshots Master Series on Spotify? It's it's pretty simple, actually. You pop open your Spotify, like a lot of us, 40,000 of us, in fact, are doing when we're listening to the weekly show, and you go up to the search bar and type in Moonshots Master, and that should come up pretty easily. I don't think there's anybody else out there connected with us. Now, when you're in there, you can see a series of episodes. Some of them have a little icon, say paid. Some of them are free trailers. But if you click on the about section and see more, there'll be a link. It'll say something quite inspiring about the deep dive that we do into the entrepreneurial growth area, but also a URL to anchor.fm where any of us can become a paid subscriber. Now we're going to continue offering Patreon, of course, but this is going to be a brand new way for those who want to maybe stay in the Spotify ecosystem where you can subscribe to the Moonshots Master Series. Very, very handy way. So if you're into Spotify and you want to pick up the Master Series, jump in there into your search bar and get loaded with massive deep dives into the Moonshots model, all of these practices to learn out loud together, to be the best version of yourself. And we have not stopped learning with Sean Aker and the Happiness Advantage. And we're going to do something in a second that sounds really weird, Mark. You're going to have to help us out. He's he's going to talk about falling up. What's all that about? Well, it's going to be a tricky one, isn't it? But particularly when we're thinking about the uh, the opposite side of happiness where you feel like you're falling down. So in this next clip, we're going to hear from Earning Ability, who's breaking down and discussing Sean's idea of this idea of falling up, but also this concept of prioritization of happiness. Now, no matter how hard you try to be positive, bad things are going to happen to you. And when stress and crisis hits, our brains map different paths to help us cope. You've heard the saying, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. That's only true if you view those crisis points as an opportunity to grow and develop. When being sent off to battle, soldiers are regularly told by their doctors that they'll either come back normal or with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But Aker tells us that there's an often overlooked third option called post-traumatic growth. Basically, the story you tell yourself about adversity determines how you will deal with it. People that have a positive explanatory style interpret adversity as local and temporary 
whereas those with a pessimistic explanatory style see the events as global and permanent. To help you see a path from adversity to opportunity, practice the ABCD model of interpretation. Adversity, belief, consequence, and disputation. Adversity is what happened. We can't change it. Belief is our reaction to the event, which is a conscious choice. Our belief leads to a consequence. And if our current belief about the situation leads us down a path to a negative consequence, we can dispute our belief because that's all it is, a belief. Mark, look, if you can, if you can say everything happens for a reason, and that reason is to serve me, this is the technique on how to do what Sean Aker refers to in the happiness advantages. This is how we fall up. Now, what I think is interesting, Mark, is often when you know what is hitting the fan, we almost invariably always um, think, oh, it's terrible. You get stressed, you get anxious, and you totally lack the capacity to see the bright side, right? Isn't that the enemy here? Well, I, I think that this might be one of the big, uh, to build on what we were saying earlier, the big aha here. And it's similar to what you were saying in the previous clip, Mike, this idea of uh, seeing challenges as opportunities to say good. But I think this, again, ch- takes some practice, doesn't it? Because not only is it something where you're trying to uh, see an opportunity for growth from a particular challenge, right? This is a bit tough. Maybe I'm learning something new, but well, that's great. I can journal about it later. I can reflect on it. I can get stronger for the next time. But I think it's also about reframing your idea of disregarding certain situations. So exactly as you were just saying then, Mike, when something hits the fan, uh, then you naturally kind of want to shy away, don't you? It's yeah. the fight or flight. Yeah. yeah. You, you feel as though the only option, the only desirable option is to flee. I'm going to save that problem for another day. Tomorrow <laughs> I'll feel better about it. But invariably you feel exactly the same or you feel worse the next day because you've delayed the attention that you need to give it. And for me, Mike, again, going back to the idea of uh, percolating on something that's quite negative, when I've got something on my mind that feels a little bit, uh, let's say, unpositive, maybe it's something about hitting the fan and I feel a bit nervous about it. If I put it off for too long, you know what happens? I feel worse. And that's because I'm not addressing it. I'm not trying to go out and and take action over it. And I think what where Sean's uh, idea around post-traumatic growth can really come in here is trying to reframe that moment of noticing it feels a bit unpleasant. Ooh, that email, that call, that conversation, that didn't feel so good. (laughs) Okay, well, let's have a think about this. Let's reflect on it rather than instantly, you know, going uh, out and and blaming that person, you know, whatever it may be. Well, this really for me, brings us to one of the biggest themes of the Moonshots podcast, which is a growth mindset. And we don't have to avoid failure. We can embrace it. I mean, some of the arguments I would give you, let's say we failed at something just then. Well, at least we know in the future what not to do. That's like the most pessimistic upside I can give you on something, right? But maybe this brings me closer to finding the right answer, right? Because like, let's say there's a hundred possibilities and I tried one far. Well, at least now I'm down one, I'm down to 99 possibilities. Yeah, fair. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Well, and, and this is the same concept, I believe, when we come to creating products and utilizing prototypes, yeah. testing and learning. Yeah, and it's okay if it fails. Uh, you know, we're that much closer to success. But the other bigger thing is uh, something that that clip touched on is, well, if it doesn't kill me, then it's kind of making me stronger. And this reminds me of Zaha Hadid, who as an immigrant woman in the 60s was learning to become an architect in, in London. And you can only just imagine the challenges she faced getting into that boys club, but then she decided to bring some radical, curvy, organic design shapes to a world of, you know, right angles. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, 
her mark has been enormous on the places uh, that occupy our cities and spaces and environments and shapes. And she transformed architecture and she literally said every challenge she met, she saw as actually making her stronger and more capable. And I think that's the, the highest form of this kind of falling up. You're reducing the variables. So, you know, you're cutting it down like, I, well, if that didn't work, at least now I can focus on other things because maybe they'll work. But more than that, you can know that you have overcome that. And do you know when you've just run a marathon, Mark? One of the most powerful feelings is the like, whoa, that was tough, but I did it. And there is a feeling of completeness that you cross that line and you're done. You're like, you're really done. And I've never experienced done like that before because I was so peaceful that I had run as hard as I could. I had run 42 kilometers or 26 miles and I felt, I I wouldn't say that I was like exuberant. It was even more profound than that. I had planned and worked for months. I had achieved something. I had, as, as they say in America, I'd left it all on the field. Like I, like I couldn't have gone, you know, Mm. a second faster. And I was just so happy, so satisfied. Was it as fast as I'd wanted to? No. Um, Was I sore? Yeah. But here's the thing. Like I gave it everything. I had a good plan, stuck to the plan, got the job done. And yeah, next time I'll do it better and prepare even better. And this to me is at the very heart of, of falling up. There were runs in practice that really hurt. There was soreness and discomfort that really hurt. But in the end of the day, when you look at something that's very easy to measure, you ran the race, you completed it. It Mm. was a very deep sense of happiness and fulfillment. And that's what's there for all of us on anything we want to do is see all of that hardship as falling up and that we will all have our own marathon, post-marathon satisfaction, regardless of it's something in your personal or your professional life. It's all there for the taking. I think we have to demystify, take the veneer of how bad failure is and say, well, good. Now I'm that much closer to finding success and that didn't kill me so I can keep going. So I can take so much from failure. I think, you know, as you, as I'm listening to you to speak, Mike, something's really coming back to me and that's the work of Mark Manson, the subtle art of not giving a, and as you might remember when we, when we did a show on uh, number 167, I think he was really helping us uh, compartmentalize how much we are influenced by the opinions of others. And I think what might happen when it comes to, uh, let's, let's continue the marathon case. What probably puts off a lot of people is the perception of others. Why, what, what, what might they think of me? Uh, maybe they are questioning why I'm doing a marathon. Maybe they'll be really interested in my finish time. Maybe they'll uh, think negatively of my training regime. Maybe they'll laugh at me behind my back. All of these things that are going to trip you up and probably either A, make you train poorly or B, not make you take the challenge or the risk or booking the marathon at all because you're worried about those other people. And I think isn't it a shame how much we are influenced. And again, coming back to this topic of happiness, you are influenced by, unless you keep it in check, the opinions of others to the extent that you won't give yourself a chance at being happy because you haven't given yourself a chance to go out and face adversity and overcome it. What a, what an ironic twist that we deprive ourselves of like a human right of feeling happy, either through fear of failure, self-doubt, um, which are just things in your mind. That's the craziest thing. Like you might not go out, um, to a social event because you're uncomfortable meeting people. You might not dance on the dance floor because you don't want to look like an idiot. You might not run a marathon because you don't want to fail and everybody goes, you didn't finish. Who cares? Yeah. 
exactly. Who freaking cares? Just do it. Uh, that's the invitation here. But our invitations for unlocking the happiness advantage, Mark, we ain't done yet. That's right. We do have one more clip, don't we, Mike? And actually, this one more clip sadly brings us to the end of this current series on happiness. But don't you worry, listeners and members, we have a stonking bookend to the happiness series, as well as closing the show with Sean Acker on the happiness advantage. And that's hearing from the queen of television and the individual who I think Mike has probably brought to light a lot of the members of our Moonshots library by now, and that's Oprah Winfrey. So we're going to hear as closing out the show in today's episode on the happiness advantage, Sean and Oprah talking about cause and effect. How do we become happier today? I think that to be to recognize the fact that this moment, the fact that you got to watch this conversation on happiness is a privilege, right? It's an opportunity that many of the people in the world didn't get. And we've got to not only be grateful for that moment, but take it to the next moment. Yeah, and then the question, why did that show up in your life right now? Yes. Because people needed a little happiness lift. And to recognize that people around us need to hear what they didn't just get to hear. Like if there's somebody in your life who didn't get to hear about uh, that, that happiness could be a choice. We need to actually be living models for that for other people. Yeah. One of the other things I liked um, that we, 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 we didn't mention before is you, you talk about random acts of kindness. Yes. Which for years on the Oprah show, we, would, we actually yes. created right. shows around yeah. random acts of kindness. And oh my God, you want to feel good about a day? Right. Do just something randomly good for somebody that they wouldn't expect. And it doesn't have to be like a big gift or something. Just a random gesture. It's a happiness multiplier, right? Because not only does it make you happy and make those people happy, but as soon as you start talking about it, even thinking back to some of those random acts of kind, we immediately start to smile. Yes. And what what I love about it yeah, is... I remember going through the door and knocking on the door of the woman. Do you remember yeah. that? Years ago, knocking on the door and saying, you have the day off. I've checked with your boss. Oh, that was such a fun moment. First she went, ah! Slammed the door. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, but the other thing it shows us is how much power we have. We have the power to actually change the reality we see around us. Yeah. And one of the things we've talked about is that that oftentimes we just feel like this world makes my happiness or not. Like if things are not going well, it's because of what the world is giving me. It's always about like a powerlessness compared to our genes or to our chemicals or to a, the, the environment. And what we're finding is that when you do a random act of kindness, it shatters that. Because what it says is, whoa, I could actually not only change my own levels of happiness, but I could change them for other people. I'm going to start writing the social script and I'm going to write a script that causes people to be able to choose happiness better. Mark, cause and effect. I mean, this brings a, a beautiful loop back to the first clip that we had, which is happiness first, success later. That's cause and effect right there, isn't it? Well, and again, if in a funny sort of way, it brings me all the way back to that first episode we did in the happiness series with Dan Harris, oh, who yeah. was always chasing success. Mm. Uh, and in doing so, he burnt himself out. And then he discovered these tips, tricks, and, and habits to be that little bit happier. And where we've ended up here with Sean Aker is somebody who devoted his his life, his career, his education around happiness. And I think it's, it's a funny... Um, formula or, or, or maybe it's the fulcrum and lever, in fact, where we've got Sean throughout today's show talking to us about how if you start with that happiness, you can influence and change your reality. And what he's covering there with, with Oprah, not only is this great little proactive daily tip to do maybe random acts of kindness, uh, whether they're buying a coffee for a stranger or just opening the door for somebody, whatever it might be, it can be very, very small and has a compound effect. But he's also talking about how we all have the ability to change the reality that's around us because ultimately the reality that's around us is influenced by how we visualize it and see it, how we interpret events and so on. And, uh, and I think this clip has... So much to give us in terms of happiness, but I would argue that this kind of thinking is that the highest level of moonshots thinking. This is where we understand that our situation is our choice. The situation is our responsibility. There is no blame or judgment for anybody else. We can make the choice. If we're not happy, make the choice. Mm -hmm. Start with a smile. Start with a random act of kindness. Start the ball rolling. 
Continue to do it every single day. This is so moonshots. This interconnects with so many other things that we've talked about over almost, Mark, 200 shows, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Um, This to me is like a great way to bring together the work of, of Sean Aker Take ownership for it. Make it a practice. It's like going to the gym. You got to do it every day. You got to get that exercise and flex those muscles. Poof, Mark, this has been a great way to close out um, not only the Sean Aker show, but the happiness series. What does it leave uh, you with? What's the one thought that's going to get more attention from you after we finish recording? Oh, I think it's going to be the Tetris effect. Mm. Um, only because, well, for two reasons. One, because it's such a vivid and easy to understand framework and mindset um, hack, I suppose. But also it just reinforces the idea of reflecting on things quite regularly, revisiting that journal, revisiting those mantras and trying to focus on the things that make me happy because they will ultimately ladder up Maybe it'll complete the whole line like in Tetris, <laughs> take it one step further. But more importantly, it's going to be something that I'm going to then uh, exist within. It'll be something that's continually on my mind, which I really, really like from a positive reinforcement aspect. Yeah. What about yourself, Mike? I'm loving Tetris effect. I'm loving the fulcrum and the effect. I just love anything that's sort of taking an idea and putting it into practice. Mm. Bit of a sucker for that. So I can happily uh, swim in those two uh, for days, perhaps weeks um, after this show. Well, Mark, listen, thank you for sharing your fulcrums and your levers and your Tetris effects and your falling ups because this has been uh, a delightful, one even might say a happy show and series. And thank you to you, our listeners and our members. Today was show 197, where we studied the work of Sean Aker and his book, The Happiness Advantage. And it started with the fight, the battle, that when we're in real, real hard work, we think, you know, if I work just a little bit harder, I'll be more successful. And if I'm a bit more successful, I might then just find happiness. Well, you're wrong. It's happiness first, success second. This is the big idea. And it starts with changing your performance by changing your mindset using the fulcrum and the lever. And then you have to understand that you cannot control the world, but you can control your reaction to it, your view, and use that testress effect. And as you go out on the journey every single day, every single week, to try and be the best version of yourself, yeah, some things ain't going to happen right. And you have to understand the mantra. Everything happens for a reason, and that reason is there to serve me. This is what Sean called falling up. And bringing it home with Sean and Oprah together saying this is all about actions have a direct effect on their outcomes. You're the boss, you're driving, it's cause and effect, and the choice is yours. That's so much of what we got from Sean Aker and the entire Happiness Series. And it really truly is what we're all about here on the Moonshots podcast. We're we're about learning together, learning out loud together so that we can be the very best happy version of ourselves. Okay, that's a wrap.